Hey everybody, I'm Jim Moore, the founder and owner of ProfessionalExamTutoring.com. Today we are going to bring you our Series 7 Top Off Exam Cheat Sheet. This is the seven most difficult Series 7 Top Off Exam topics that you may find on the Series 7 exam. It also represents some of the seven most requested topics that we tend to get in our tutoring services. So we're going to break this up into two sections. We're going to start off with part one, and you can look for the next video on our YouTube page for part two. In terms of what these videos will cover, first we're going to cover options and specifically the spreads strategy, which tends to trip up a lot of people. Next, we'll get into convertible bonds, some of the math calculations involved there. Then we will look to cost basis of bonds using the amortization and accretion methods. Next, fundamental analysis, taking a look at the balance sheet and income statement ratios and related equations. After that, suitability, a very important topic for the Series 7 top off exam. You definitely want to know as much as you can about suitability, how to read the questions, and identify the specific language that will tip you off to the right answer. So you take a look at that. Next is stop limit orders. Stop limit orders are neither stop nor limit orders, but both combined into one order. These trip up a lot of people, so we'll take a look into that as well. And then lastly, margin calls in the margin section, but specifically calculating the market value that leads to a margin call. All right, well, without any further ado, let's get started. All right, so we're going to start our lesson here in options with the spread strategy that's covered on the Series 7 top-off exam. The reason why we start here is because this is by far and away the most requested topic that we get asked about when it comes to Series 7 tutoring. Just a quick review, the spread strategy is a way to hedge your bet because you'll be betting in opposite directions essentially and we'll show you visually how that works in a section. The next portion that you should know is that selling one option tends to lower or offset the cost of purchasing another and that's because you're always going to be going long one option and short the other one. So there's call spreads or put spreads. For a call spread you're going long a call and you're going short a call. For a put spread you're going long a put and you're going short a put. So what this ultimately does is it minimizes the downside because in this section there are no unlimited losses. However, at the same time, because you're minimizing your downside, you're also minimizing your upside in that there are no unlimited gains. If we had two different strike prices, and let's assume that this may be a call spread. So if you had a call spread, you'd be long a call with maybe a strike price of 40 and short a call with maybe a strike price of 50. So between the 40 and 50 is where the maximum gain and maximum loss potential are relegated to because the best you can do is in between these two strike prices because the long call is betting up and the short call is betting down. That basically eliminates any possibility that any type of profit potential could happen outside of here because above here the short call would be offset by the long call and below here the long call and short call um, wouldn't even be exercisable. So your max profit, max loss um, would be relegated to inside of the strike prices. This is also assuming that you would have a spreads a spread strategy where you only have um, where you do have different strike prices. You do have some where you may have the same strike prices, but many will be different. But the next slide I want to show you to start is just how to identify what's known as a debit spread and a credit spread. This is kind of uh, the heart of some of the major confusing questions that we get from students. So let's take a look here. So debit spread is essentially another way of saying that you're spending money. So remember that we said that 
A spread is typically buying a call and shorting a call, so there are going to be two offsetting transactions. Well, you may be putting more emphasis on one of those than the other. If you're putting more emphasis on the buying call, meaning your bet is bigger for the buying part than it is for the selling part, then you're going to have what's called a debit spread. So for example, you may have this long ABC March 45 call for five, and you may be short ABC March 50 call for two. We can see that the dominant bet or dominant leg here would be the long ABC March 45 call for five because the premium represents the price of this bet and the bet is being focused on the long call. Therefore, we're spending $5 here and we're actually making $2 on the short call because we're selling the call for $2. So on a net basis, meaning just subtracting the five and adding the two, we have a negative three. That means overall we're spending $3 on the premium. So therefore you are a net buyer. Now when it comes to a credit spread, you will be receiving money. So the example we'll have here is a long ABC March 35 call for three and a short ABC March 25 call for five. So in this case, we see that the short portion happens to be the highest premium and the long portion happens to be the lowest premium. Now, wherever the highest premium is, is the focus of our bet. So we would say that's the dominant bet or dominant leg. We see that we are spending $3 by purchasing the call, the March 35 call, and we're receiving $5 by selling the March 25 call. So overall, our net position is a net receiving of money of $2. So our net premium is plus two, and therefore this is a credit spread because we are a net seller. Now, another very easy trick to figure out whether you're a buyer or a seller, if it's a credit versus a debit, is just to look at the number of letters. A lot of people use this trick where seller is six letters, you'll notice credit is six letters, buyer is five letters, and you'll notice debit is five letters. This trick also works with something called widen and narrow. We won't get that detailed in, in this one, but the five letters for widen also aligns with debit, the, five letter, the six letters for narrow also aligns with credit. Okay, so the last thing we wanna cover in this cheat sheet when it comes to options, because this is a very important section, is how to calculate the max gain, max loss, and break even. So if you have long one ABC March 45 call for five and short one ABC March 50 call for two, and remember this again is a spread because we're long a call and we're short a call. The way we're going to do this is to first break it down into parts. So first we're going to calculate the max gain and max loss. And to do that, let's take a look at what steps you want to go through in order to determine the max gain, max loss. So the first thing you want to do is take a look to see if it is a debit spread or a credit spread. And remember from previous slides, we see that the dominant bet is the one with the higher premium, which over here is the five. So the long call, is the dominant bet. And when you're long a call, you're spending out money, you're paying out five, you're only receiving two, so therefore we know it is a debit spread. Next we wanna know, okay, is the dominant bet a long bet or a short bet? And just like we said here, since this one's the dominant bet, we see that it is a long bet. So long meaning you're the buyer. And step three says, okay, is it the maximum gain that is equal to the premium? or the maximum loss that is equal to the premium? Well, we know that when we reference a long bet, it is always the maximum loss that is equal to the premium because the worst that you can do when you go long a stock, I'm sorry, long an option, is lose the premium. So if you lose the premium, then that tells you what the max loss is. In this case, it's going to be the five minus two because we always do net premiums when it comes to spreads. So five minus two would be the max loss, which we'll show you in a second. And the other formula is going to be what's called the weird formula. The other formula will be applied to the max gain 
because remember we know that max gains will never be unlimited when it comes to calls because in spreads we have an offsetting bet so we see here that the max loss is five minus two which is three which is the net premium five minus two and the max gain we refer to it as the weird formula which is the strike price minus strike price so 50 minus 45 minus the five minus two which is the net premiums again and that works out for any situation where you have a debit spread now when it comes to break even we are again going to look to the dominant bet the dominant bet is what we're going to use for our anchor price or what we're ba uh, basing the break-even price off of so the 45 and again we take the net of the premiums here so 5 minus 2 is 3 and just like regular call option break-evens where you're only dealing with one call option you would just treat this the same type of way so you would add the premium to the strike price and you would get 45 plus 3 so if this was a put option for example and you had 5 minus 2 here for the premium you do uh, 45 minus 3 so you get 42 so if it was a put option it'd be 42 but since it's a call option it is 48 okay so next we are going to move on to convertible bonds so what makes convertible bonds particularly challenging for a lot of our students is that there are a few different steps along the way in getting to the answer that they're typically asking of you the first is going to be making sure you know how to calculate the conversion ratio. The conversion ratio here you can see is the bond par value divided by conversion price. So we all remember that the par value of a bond is $1,000. So it's always $1,000 in the numerator divided by the conversion price. And they have to give you the conversion price in the question. This is not something that you can figure out. They would have to give you the conversion price in the question. Now, um, just to briefly pivot over in a quick digression to preferred stocks if this was a conversion ratio that was applicable to preferred stocks instead of a thousand dollars as a par value you'd use a hundred dollars as a par value but we're going to stick with bonds for this conversation so let's move on and take a look at a quick example an investor buys a crocodile corp four and a half percent 2030 convertible bond at par the bond can be converted at forty dollars Crocodile Corp reports strong earnings and the stock jumps 10% from initial parity while the bond increases to 102. Should the investor convert? Okay, so like most convertible questions, unless they straight up give you the conversion ratio in the question, which they sometimes do, which kind of throws people off because they always expect to calculate it, the first thing then that you will need to do is calculate the conversion ratio. So we see here that can be converted at $40 per share. And like I mentioned before, they have to give you this number if they don't give you the conversion ratio itself. So they give you the conversion price. So remember the, the equation is conversion ratio equals par value divided by conversion price. And that is going to set us up with par value, which is a thousand divided by $40, which gives us an answer of 25. Now what 25 means is that if you have one convertible bond, you will convert that into 25 stocks. So one convertible bond of Corp, uh, Crocodile Corp would give you 25 stocks if you converted from a bond to stocks. The next step that we're going to want to do is to calculate what the share price should be if we were to convert this from a bond into stock. So when we say that the price should be equal to something when there's a conversion what we really mean to say is that the bond value and the stock price should always be trading at parity and at parity would be at exactly 25 times different from each other so for example if the bond if the i'm sorry if the stock is currently trading at 40 the bond should be trading at a thousand dollars because if you can trade one one thousand dollar bond for 25 shares priced at $40 per share, you're getting something equivalent to $1,000. So they should be trading at parity. So what you wanna do is, if you know that parity is, the, the conversion ratio is 25, then the parity value is going to be some multiple of 25. 
So here we can set it up by knowing that the bond increased to 102. If the bond increased to 102, that means the value of the bond is 1,020. And we're being asked if the investor should convert or not, but we don't know what the stock price is at that time. So we'd say what the stock price should be if the bond value is 1,020 is solving for stock price. We take 25, put it underneath 1,020. We find that it's $40.80. So the stock price should be $40.80 when the bond price or bond value is 1,020. So what we see is as the new stock price, based off of what they're telling us in the question, is that Crocodile is reporting strong earnings and the stock jumps 10% from initial parity. Well, 10% from initial parity is actually going to be $44. And we get that by adding the 10% to the $40. So there's two ways you can go about doing this, but the math is basically the same. So the new stock price should be, I'm sorry, the new stock price is $44. But from our calculations in the previous step, we know that it should be $40.80. So if we're going to answer the question, should Mrs. Smith convert, we're going to compare the fact that the stock price is actually $44 and it should be $40.80. So in that kind of situation, you could see that, well, you should convert because the stock is actually more than what it should be worth in the market. So in the market, it's currently $44. So if you, if you trade in your convertible bonds, you convert them into stock you're going to get stock that's trading in the market at 44, but you know it should actually be worth 40, 80. So what you would do is you would convert them in the market for stock worth $44, and then you would probably sell the stock since you know that it's worth less than 44. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at in this cheat sheet is the amortization and accretion of a bond's cost basis. So, here we look into the munis section of the Series 7 top-off exam and we find that they ask you to calculate often a bond's new cost basis as it approaches maturity. Now, in our video courses, you'll see a little more detail than this, but graphically, we wanted to show you that if you buy any bond outside of maturity, so in this case, it's, you bought it at a premium, at, let's say 107, it's going to amortize toward par value as it approaches maturity. So basically what this means is that the cost of the bond is going to be adjusted each and every single year downward toward par value. And if you decide on any particular year to sell the bond and you sell it above where its adjusted cost basis is, you would make a gain. Or if you sell it below where the adjusted cost basis is, you would make a loss. So let's take a look at how they would go about asking a question like this. So Jane buys a bond at 107 with seven years left until maturity. What is the bond's taxable gain or loss if she sells it to another investor at 98 after two years? Now, before we get into this, I should also point out that it is possible for you to buy a bond at a discount and you would have to adjust the price upward in that case, which is what we call accretion of a bond's cost basis. But in this question, we're going to deal with the amortization of the bond's cost basis, which is where we're bringing it down on an adjusted basis every year as we approach par. So to answer this question, we're going to calculate it in steps. The first step that we're going to take is to calculate the new cost basis at year two. So what we see here in the question is that they really want to know what is the gain or loss if she sells to another investor after two years. Well, first we have to know what the adjusted cost basis is after two years. And to calculate the cost basis, the premium above par value, which happens to be seven, 107 minus 100 reflects the premium. So seven points above par value needs to be amortized over a period of seven years because it's seven years left until maturity. So what that tells us is that seven points divided by seven years 
equals one point per year. So this bond's cost basis gets adjusted by one point per year. So after two years, the bond's cost basis would be adjusted downward by two points from 107 down to 105. So the new cost basis um, should be 105. And we see that by the 107 minus two. So with the cost basis at 105, and we know that we sold the bond at 98 as per the question, we wanna figure out what was the gain or loss on the sale of this bond. So we take a look at step two, and now we're gonna compare the sale price with the new cost basis. So we said that the new cost basis was 105. However, we sold this bond for 98, so if we do 98 minus 105, we see that we end up with a $7 taxable loss. So in this question, if you purchased the bond originally at 107, you held it for two years, which lowered your adjusted cost basis down to 105, and you sold it for 98, clearly you can see that since it's worth 105 and you sold it for 98, you're experiencing a seven point taxable loss. Okay, well that's it for part one. The next section is going to cover the acronym SLOBS over BLISS. And some of you may recognize that that falls under the stop orders and limit orders. And specifically, we are going to cover stop limit orders. So please check out part two of this video or check out our courses online at www.professionalexamtutoring.com for more detail on all of these topics and more video courses for the Series 7 Top-Off exam. Thanks very much and see you soon.